Hi, uh, good evening, everyone. So today uh, we got Dr. Bijayanand P. Reddy sir with us for a very interesting topic: brachytherapy in ophthalmic tumors. Now, anyone in the field of radiation oncology, I know all of you know about sir, and I really do not think it needs any special mentioning about him. He is director Apollo Cancer Institute, Hyderabad, and sir is also chair of uh, our organization. And uh, sir is one of the rare radiation oncologists having dedicated, uh, done his dedicated work on ophthalmic brachytherapy and has his immense interest on that. He also has his fellowship done for ophthalmic tumors. And I think when we talk about brachytherapy in ophthalmic tumors, there is no, no other better person uh, to talk on this topic other than sir. Uh, I would request sir to take over this session and uh, start this class. Thank you so much, sir, for joining us and giving your time. Please, sir. Thank you, Dr. Uh, thanks for the kind introduction. Uh, it's uh, just by an accident that uh, I got into this um, uh, sub-site uh, ophthalmic ocular tumors. Uh, once uh, I had been to LV Prasad Eye Hospital and I saw the facilities there and I met the chairman of uh, LV Prasad and uh, he I suggested that why don't we start an ocular oncology department here. So he immediately agreed and jumped on that idea and uh, we created a ward uh, uh, of six beds uh, in LV Prasad way back in 2002. Uh, now it's been uh, 18 years uh, uh, since we started the uh, uh, Institute uh, Ocular Oncology Department. But before that, uh, they used to call me and ask for opinion for any kind of ocular oncology patients because of my association or uh, you know as a as a colleague or a friend of uh, the ocular oncologist there at LV Prasad so it's just by an accident that it all started and I'm very very happy that uh, it uh, went off very well uh, we got great experience and exposure to rarest to the rare ocular uh, and ophthalmic tumors and I'm very very happy to uh, be part of uh, the ocular oncology community uh, in the world uh, where we have an ocular oncology meetings which happen once in uh, four years um, across the globe. So we are only ocular oncologists, practicing ocular oncologists, radiation oncologists and medical oncologists who have special interest in ophthalmic tumors uh, uh, participate in these meetings and we share our experience and uh, knowledge and learn a lot more from others uh, having their uh, experience being shared. Uh, that's just a small introduction about the ocular oncology and I always keep telling in, a, in the meetings that whoever wants to uh, get into this field uh, as a sub-specialization, it's a wonderful area. Uh, there's a lot of cases in the country um, that you can focus on and you can uh, be called as a specialist in dealing with ocular oncology tumors. There's a lot of scope uh, there uh, and whoever is interested uh, can take up this uh, field. Uh, having said that, after uh, announcing this, that we can train people, we do get the students and uh, seniors coming to our institute to get a uh, experience, uh, first-hand experience in treating ocular and ophthalmic tumors uh, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in our institute. And they are uh, happy to get uh, involved and uh, uh, get some exposure and they are confident enough to go back and treat uh, the oph ophthalmic tumors. Majority of the people who are being worked with me uh, in the department who moved to Delhi and other areas, they are practicing and we are coordinating with them uh, how to treat uh, these ocular and ophthalmic tumors. That's about uh, the department and the, uh, and the field. Let us start uh, uh, the topic which was given to me, uh, which is a plaque brachytherapy, indications and outcomes in ophthalmic tumors. Uh, briefly on this, this goes on next slide. Uh, yeah, okay. All right. So we know that uh, any of ocular and ophthalmic tumor surgery is definitely an option, but you end up in uh, losing the um, uh, eyeball and uh, you lose the vision. So that is not what we want. So what is required is in a cancer management, we all agree that today's cancer management has just not the survival but we need to preserve the organ and function wherever uh, it is possible and feasible without compromising on the cure rates. 
so more importantly the eyes without eyes the world will be blind and completely uh, uh, we feel that we are uh, useless without our eyes so um, it's very very important to protect the eyes when you have tumors in the eye or uh, in the orbit so the goal of management of ophthalmic tumors is preservation of vision preservation of the eyeball and finally preservation of life so when we can preserve the vision uh, as much as possible and preserve the eyeball for cosmosis and without compromising on the life uh, definitely life should also be preserved so in the process uh, radiation uh, uh, you all agree with me and by the end of my uh, presentation you will all certainly agree with me that radiation can achieve this so we have we been treating patients with external beam radiation in the past especially retinoblastoma we used to get so many patients uh, from government institute uh, to go uh, advising them for external beam radiation different uh, as you all know most of the tumors in the orbit and the eyeball uh, are sensitive to radiation treatment uh, so we can salvage uh, the globe as well as the vision but the major disadvantage of this external beam radiation that most of these patients if you cross certain doses then you would uh, have radiation retinopathy and optic neuropathy so most of the times you end up in getting these kind of problems and uh, the cataract and dry eye is one of the most common symptom and problem that we used to face in the past when you do external beam radiation apart from that if you most of these tumors uh, we are in younger age group then you have facial deformity and growth retardation and because of the uh, rb gene you these patients uh, would certainly are very highly prone to develop secondary tumors at a later date so the brachytherapy as we all know that these are the common headings that anybody talks about brachytherapy it delivers high dose of radiation precisely and selectively to the tumor minimal dose to the surrounding structures and of course selective dose distribution and that obviously have minimal minimization of the external beam radiation complications will definitely be minimized what are the sources that we uh, are uh, using across the globe are the gold iridium palladium uh, iodine 125 and ruthenium in india uh, what we use are 125 iodine and ruthenium 106 uh, iodine 125 seeds are used in uh, shankar netralaya uh, whereas most of the uh, other centers use ruthenium and i tell you the reason why we commonly use ruthenium we uh, to briefly differentiate uh, and classify these two uh, iodine 125 and ruthenium um iodine always uh, you know you have 125 has gamma rays and we need to have lot of protection equipment in around uh, the uh, sources while designing the sources uh, while pasting the sources while putting it into the patient also you need to have lead shield in front of you before you put the uh, sources inside the patient and uh, the other disadvantage of uh, the iodine 125 is uh, half life is just 2 months and uh, the great advantage only advantage i would see that these are customized if you look at the needles uh, sources which can be uh, put at one corner and avoid at another corner and you can have a differential loading within this plat as is my arrow visible uh, dr mandal yes sir it's visible all right so this is what i mean i used to do this uh, uh, plaque preparation when i was working in wilsai hospital and uh, it's quite cumbersome and we they apply these sources uh, with the uh, uh, certain kind of a glue which sticks to this plaque so but this is an advantage that you can have a customized differential loading in this area whereas the ruthenium doesn't have a differential loading it's a uniform loading a uniform dose distribution wherever the plaque is placed that is the only disadvantage of ruthenium but otherwise it is absolutely safe because it is beta radiation and the half life is one year that means the patient we can use this source for almost two years uh, although the dose rate would come uh, lower and lower as we use it longer and longer but as i when when i continue to uh, when i show you the next few slides then you would understand when you are treating the ocular surface tumors you can use the later uh, in the second year this ruthenium plaque because the dose rate is much lower 
So, so that's other than the uh, uniform dose distribution, uh, they doesn't require any protection and uh, it is, can be used for a couple of years. So that's the only advantage that you have with radium iodine 125 and ruthenium is a commonly used uh, plaque therapy with so many advantages. So the, the supply is done by BB company, European company, and this they have different shapes. Uh, this is the notch plaque. Notch plaque is when you are putting it in the uh, anterior surface of the eye. You want to protect the cornea and treat the conjunctival surface. This is what it is. And this notch plaque is to protect the optic nerve. If the tumor is posterior in the equator, posterior to the equator and the closer to the fovea or the optic nerve, we use this notch plaque. Round plaque, if the tumor is away from the cornea, conjunctiva, sorry, cornea, or from the optic nerve, then we use the round plaque. Now, last year, we are, I'm so glad to announce that last time, last year, uh, we had a meeting in January with uh, uh, BRC, a group of physicists and uh, um, uh, two clinicians from uh, India. Uh, so we, Rav Santosh and myself, and we had, we formed a team and we had several meetings and we requested the BRC to produce ruthenium plaques. And I'm very happy to share with you. Finally, we are ready with the BRC plaque and we started using the first BRC application at Hyderabad the, with this applicator. Uh, the difference is that the cost of each plaque bracket therapy, what we used to get at when we started the procedures were around five to six lakhs. Now, presently, one plaque would cost six, uh, 11 lakh of rupees compared to 50,000 rupees, which is now available with BRC. So we have a round plaque and uh, this, uh, you get the details uh, uh, of this. This is made of silver. We have uh, two uh, inside and outside uh, uh, coverings. The outer diameter is almost 16 millimeters and the active core diameter is around 13.5 millimeters. The spherical radius is 12 millimeters. The total thickness, you'll be surprised, is just so thin. It's just one millimeter. So it's uh, useful half-life is one year and you can use it maximum of 15 times. It's only because that it might get damaged or the coverings might get low, uh, thinner and thinner. So, but, but I mean, safely you can use it for 50 times. We have a notch plug recently uh, made available. Uh, this is in July 2, 2020. And uh, so the, we, the plaques supplied by Brit is only 50,000 rupees. And the first plaque, whoever wants to start uh, the bracket therapy procedures, the first plaque is given free of cost by BARC. So plaque production and quality assurance uh, uh, is absolutely strict, very, very strictly maintained. High purity uh, fission uh, RU106 is used in this plaque. Manufacturing done under stringent regulatory guidelines and quality assurance tests are done by third party. So you're 100% sure that the quality assurance is done safe and these plaques are absolutely safe. And the best part of it is that plaques can be sterilized by routine autoclave after every use. So this is the plaque container supplied by the BRC. And this is a plaque, uh, the first plaque, uh, we are proud to announce that we first plaque of BRC designed uh, is delivered to a patient at, at our center at Hyderabad. Now this is the development of the treatment planning system. Uh, again, we had several meetings uh, with the physicist team and the clinicians. And these are uh, various uh, uh, dimensional dose distributions, horizontal and vertical. This is in the V plane and this is in the H plane. Uh, when you have the plaque in this direction and you see the in the H plane, what is the dose distribution? And uh, this is the compared to the BB plaque and the BRC plaque, you see the uh, absolutely, it's a validated with the experimental data. CCB plaque supplied by BB is equal and, uh, equal and similar to the BB, uh, the plaque supplied by the BRC. Now coming to the clinical aspects of so plaque bracket therapy, the indications are uh, the EVL melanomas. It could be iris, it could be uh, ciliary body or the choroid as such. Most of them are choroidal melanomas. And then retinoblastoma, uh, choroidal hemangiomas, choroid metastasis, 
retinal hemangiomas, uh, choroid hemangiomas, or retinal hemangiomas, and ocular surface tumors, anything on the surface which could be squamous cell neoplasia or a lymphoma of the conjunctiva or a melanoma of the conjunctiva can also be treated with uh, black bracket. Now, briefly on the modes of treatment, retinoblastoma, uh, normally when you have, uh, let me talk about retinoblastoma in the next few slides. Uh, coming to choroidal melanoma, the tumor, again, I'll show you briefly on the next few slides, what are the brief treatment of choroidal melanoma. Hemangiomas, if they are diffuse, large size hemangiomas, then you need to look at uh, external beam radiotherapy. If the tumor is less than 15 millimeters, then you can easily uh, think of doing a plaque bracket therapy, which is very, very simple and easy. And we have 95 to 100% results with the plaque bracket therapy. OSSN, ocular surface squamous cell neoplasia. Normally, we do the bulk excision by surgery, followed by ex uh, uh, plaque bracket therapy. Only if the tumor is infiltrating into the orbit, then we do external beam radiation. Choroidal meds, you know, the choroidal med, the standard of 30 gray in 10 fractions is not going to yield any kind of results. So we have experience in uh, treating plaque bracket therapy, which almost has 100% uh, results in these choroidal meds if they are smaller lesions. And off late, we have started using SRS if the lesions are bigger in size, which are not amicable for plaque bracket therapy. We do external beam radiation, stereotactic uh, SRS, RS, SRS, SRT, and then we see complete disappearance of these tumors with improvement of vision. Briefly, the retinoblastoma, we know there are several classifications. When we did medicine, it was Reese, Ellsworth was the most commonly used one. Now we have uh, international uh, staging system, international new staging system. And uh, this is the Reese Ellsworth. I'm sure most of you remember the diameters. They used to say four disc diameters. Uh, as a landmark to uh, measure the uh, the dimensions of the retinoblastoma. Uh, group one to group uh, five, those are results. Now the latest is called group A to group E. So may, basically, mainly uh, the prognosis differs by subretinal fluid collection and vitreal seeds. So based on this, uh, the tumors are classified from group A to group E where you have started with vitreous seeds and neovascular uh, blood invasion, then the results are quite poor. Group E patients are uh, sal salvage in these patients would be very, very tough. So up to group D, we can still do conservative line of management. We can get back their vision. We can salvage their eye globe. So, so all those groups, we call it as, as long as the tumor is within the eyeball, we call it as stage zero retinoblastoma. So all this bracket therapy is feasible only in stage zero retinoblastoma. Once the tumor is out of the eyeball, then it comes to stage one, two, three, and four, we all know. So basically in a group one E uh, or group AB as for the name, international retinoblastoma classification, then it is most of the times it is treated by the ophthalmologist, cryotherapy, thermotherapy, or laser photocoagulation. The latest one is thermotherapy. It's called TTT, transpupillary thermotherapy, which is the most commonly used, less toxic, less side effects, and more effective. Then the next is group three and group four. Uh, the radiation has taken a backseat because of the introduction of etoposide and carboplatin based chemotherapy. Most of these tumors are treated with uh, uh, chemotherapy, which is called SHIELDS protocol. I was fortunate to. Uh, go and uh, so to Wilsai Hospital, where this protocol has been designed. Uh, I met Mr. Shields and Mr. Shields, and they had more than 10,000 cases of retinoblastoma data with them. And it was the most popular in the world. It's called Shields, uh, Wilsai Hospital, uh, which is attached to CHOP Hospital, which is Children's uh, Hospital of Philadelphia. So I was fortunate to spend time there in that institute with these guys. So the most of the time, uh, uh, these patients are treated with uh, chemo reduction, that is vincristin, etoposide, and carboplatin. Whoever is interested, I'll share this protocol, share those protocols with you guys. And they have an extremely good responses with this chemotherapy. And then after reducing in size, then we do local therapy. Only in patients who have recurrence and after chemo reduction and after local therapy, 
then only we do plaque brachytherapy. Once the patient has got vitreous seeds, then we do external beam radiation treatment. So the indications of plaque brachytherapy and retinoblastoma are only for patients who have chemo reduction failure or recurrence. And the diameter of the tumor has to be around less than 14 millimeters and the maximum thickness can be allowed up to, we treat up to seven to eight millimeters, but preferably 14 millimeters diameter and six millimeters thickness, the results would be very, very good. And the dose to be delivered, these are radio sensitive tumors and 45 to 50 centigrade to the apex of the tumor. The range is because of the dose rate and the new plaque or the old plaque based on the dose rate and the depth of what we are delivering, then we decide on the dose from 45 to 50 gray. Most of the tumors respond very well to plaque brachytherapy. Melanomas management, I don't want to get into the details. You all know if they accidentally detected melanomas of less than 1.5 millimeters, only observation. Between 1.5 to 4 millimeters, then you do transthermal uh, thermotherapy, as I was telling you, when you treat for the retinoblastomas. These are very highly sophisticated uh, uh, treatment, which is local cauterization of the uh, thermal therapy of the lesions, and they do very well if their diameter is less than 4 millimeters. Anywhere between 4 millimeters to 10 millimeters, we do plaque brachytherapy, and it's quite effective. 90% response rates with plaque brachytherapy in choroidal, uh, choroidal melanomas. So the procedure uh, is uh, uh, fairly simple. We use a, a specific, uh, it's called a B ultrascan, uh, ultrasound scan, which we put it on the lateral part in the temporal region of the uh, orbit. And then you can easily visualize the eye globe and then you see the dimensions of the tumor with the ultrasound. This is a tumor here and you get the diameter, location, basal diameter and height. This is a basal diameter and this is a height is measured by an ultrasound. And we also do a CT scan and sometimes an MRI scan to understand the dimensions of the tumor uh, in these patients. Once you have that, then, then we draw, it's called a retinal uh, diagram from 12 o'clock. Uh, this is like a clock and we draw the diagram, 9.4 into five and the five millimeters is the height of the tumor. So this is drawn on the retinal diagram and then we have a radio radiotherapy planning, uh, rag brachytherapy planning system supplied by the BBIC. Uh, so this has a, a simulator uh, where we can, can um, get this uh, retinal diagram onto the software, onto the screen, select the plaque size and shape based on the dimensions of the tumor. And then required dose normally uh, can be prescribed for the base as well as apex, but ideally uh, the best dose should be uh, uh, prescribed at the apex because the apex is, has to get the uh, dose what is we, we intend to deliver. So that is very, very important to prescribe the dose to the apex. So dosimetry is automated dosimetry or you can do manual. Uh, automated dosimetry is supplied by the BBIC uh, with the MAC uh, software and dose and exposure time are calculated and then uh, that is given to the clinician. It's a teamwork, obviously, with an ophthalmologist, radiation oncologist, and physicist working together. And this is the planning dosimetry. So BB plaque simulator 4.12 supplied by BB company. Bark, as of now, we still in the process of developing a software. We're all working very seriously on it, and we're almost there. Probably in a couple of months, we are able to get the uh, uh, software up. But meanwhile, we are doing manual calculation. Uh, which normally, even if you do a uh, plaque uh, simulator calculation, we do check with the manual calculation whether the dosimetry is correct or not. At least the apex, uh, from the base to the apex, what is the dose delivered to the plaque. And this is the uh, simulator. And this, this can be moved with a mouse and placed on, this is a tumor. And this is the plaque with a notch, which is around the optic nerve. You can see that there is no a plaque in this area. It is surrounded in the optic nerve, but the tumor is just close to the optic nerve, but the optic nerve is paid. Now, this is how uh, in uh, the dosimetry, this um, the uh, clockwise, if you look at it, uh, the base is almost getting 48,000 centigrade and the intended dose that 
look at around that is 45 to 46 uh, hundred centigrade and just few millimeters away it is hardly uh, 500 centigrade so this is an other angle and this is how it is uh, if you look at the entire uh, area where the primary tumor is and you look at the dark red spots here this is the intended area should get uh, the 4600 centigrade and uh, this is from a distance it is hardly 500 centigrade and on the back side also you could see is hardly because there is a shielding the plaque itself has a shielding which delivers only in the concave surface of the plaque the external surface has hardly any dose so plaque placement is normally done under either general anesthesia or local anesthesia we have done several cases under local anesthesia as well uh, only if the patient is apprehensive then we usually go with the general anesthesia but in children there is no option we have to do under general anesthesia so conjectival peri peritomy means that which i'll show you in the next slide uh, it's an incision just around the cornea and then you can uh, pull up the conjectiva so tumor location is marked on the sclera with just a marker pen we just uh, mark it on the this sclera and you have a dummy plaque which is a plastic which which i'll show you in the next few slides uh, dummy plaque used to confirm the location we place the plaque and do an ultrasound again make sure that the sound the uh, plaque is right on the uh, tumor and then that is replaced with the ruthenium plaque and then sutured to the sclera and then the conjective again sutured back in position and patient is kept in an isolation patient is uh, lying on the bed is not really required he'll be moving in the room so we normally do not attend uh, allow the attender to uh, go inside but because the, the child is smaller the child is very small the mother normally is allowed to go because it's a beta radiation outside the patient the radiation is hardly anything so this is what i was telling you about the conjectural peritotomy uh, this is just at the edge of the cornea we just do a small incision and then peel off the conjectiva and this is a dummy plaque to confirm the location see this is a dummy plaque uh, which is placed and i was telling you this is called uh, the marking where the eye of the uh, plaque is come, supposed to come to this area and then you suture it so this is the container ruthenium plaque in a lead container supplied by bb and this is a ruthenium plaque supplied by bb company and this is a plaque you see this uh, you see the eye here marked by the pen and this eye is sutured here they have two eyes the posterior part of player automatically because ocular surface uh, uh, muscles uh, they keep the uh, plaque intact without motility only at the anterior end we suture with these two eyes and that's quite uh, safe to uh, do that so after the plaque placement uh, the conjectiva is sutured back this is see plaque is not even visible here and this conjectiva is again uh, sutured by the side of the cornea and then the plaque is removed after the exposure time exposure time depends on the type of the tumor what you are treating uh, anything ranging from 3000 centigrade to 10000 centigrade so 10000 centigrade for a melanoma then the, the the treatment time would range from 2 to even 5 to 6 days sometimes but the patients are absolutely comfortable you don't need to worry about being have the plaque being inside so follow up is usually four to six weeks until regression of the tumor occurs. Uh, the tumor regression, I'll tell you for each tumor takes a little differently. So for retinoblastoma, uh, try, time to respond is from two to three months. Usually it becomes an, a calcified scar from fish flesh appearance to calcified scar. 80 to 90% of them would respond. Choroidal hemangiomas is a pre-treatment and a post-treatment. Time to respond is six weeks, responds quite rapidly, including the improvement in the vision, and 90% of them, more than 90% of them would respond. Even the subretinal fluid also gets disappeared. It becomes flat, reduction in height of the uh, hemangiomas. Melanomas, time to respond takes longer time, but nevertheless, we keep a follow-up every six weeks. We do an examination to see what is regression or there is any progression. And at six months is the maximum time that it responds and becomes absolutely flat and color discoloration of the tumor happens. It becomes flat, less vascular, and the color changes happen 
and again reduction in the subretinal fluid is an indication that the tumor has responded. Now uveal melanoma, she's a massive tumor here and then the post treatment completely discolored and become flat. Ocular surface neoplasms and these are the lesions which have, uh, uh, this is a tumor, such kind of bulky tumors normally we excise it and then base we put the brachytherapy source and you, this is on the follow up, patient is absolutely fine. These kind of tumors, you don't need to excise. You can stay straight away, go for the plaque brachytherapy, and at the end of the day, extremely good results like this. Now, this is again another tumor which has been excised and then plaque brachytherapy. This is a tumor which is closer to the cornea, and this is post radiation, post radiation only brachytherapy. So, we have uh, analyzed uh, 232 cases till October 2019. By this end, end of the year, we have completed more than 300 cases. We, I would come out with those results uh, uh, in my next class, probably. Now, as you all know, this is nothing uh, new. We all know that the melanomas require higher doses. An average of 10,000 centigrade has been uh, normally is prescribed at the apex of the tumor. Uh, and then uh, the, uh, the base, uh, which I forgot to mention, if you're delivering 10,000 centigrade to uh, the apex, the base, the sclera, would almost get around uh, 100,000 centigrade uh, to 120,000 centigrade. So fortunately, uh, the sclera can tolerate uh, 75,000 to 100,000 centigrade comfortably without any scleral necrosis. That's the best part of the eyeball and the sclera. So we don't need to, we don't need to worry about uh, delivering such high doses. So, but if the tumor, height of the tumor is more than seven or eight millimeters, then it becomes very, very difficult to deliver 10,000 centigrade. So in that case, what we normally do, uh, as we do for an uh, uh, AV malformation in the brain, phased manner. So we do, uh, you do a part of the AVM uh, uh, treatment uh, initially, and then rest of the, after a gap, then you do a second dose of, uh, SRS. So similarly here, we do plaque brachytherapy therapy in two sittings. So we deliver the dose around six to seven millimeters and then it becomes flatter. And then we do second dose of uh, plaque brachytherapy therapy in melanomas, which are, which are uh, the height of the tumor is more than seven or eight millimeters. And we are not able to deliver those to the apex. The choroidal hemangiomas, our experience initially as a textbook knowledge, they say it's 2,500 centigrade should be enough. But we had recurrences, in, uh, so we had to do a second uh, sitting with a plaque bracket therapy. Now we straight away go up to 3,500 centigrade and we have 100% results with uh, this kind of a dose in a plaque bracket therapy, which is quite safe to deliver. Retinoblastoma, it's around 45 to 50 gray. Uh, we all know that's a sensitive tumor, 45 gray should be good enough. So based on the tumor dimensions and the dose rate, we deliver around 45 to 50 gray. OSSN, again, based on the post excision base positive or uh, radical doses, it ranges from 5,500 to 6,000 centigrade uh, with uh, plaque bracket therapy. So minimal acceptable dose is 60 uh, centigrade per hour. Uh, most of them are low dose rate to medium dose rate, uh, uh, what we get with this plaque bracket therapy, ruthenium plaque bracket therapy. Ideally, I would say 100 to 400 centigrade per hour and above. Uh, uh, and above in the sense when the tumor, we are putting it in the ocular surface, then you get more than 400 centigrade. That is acceptable. That is conjunctival carcinomas. We call it as OSSN, ocular surface neoplasias. So with ruthenium, we get around 60 to 600 centigrade. Do not accept, uh, do not use the source if the dose is less than 40 gray. Although ICRU report says we can use up to uh, 40 centigrade per hour, but normally uh, the effectivity will come down if it goes uh, less than 60. And not only that, the, the uh, treatment time goes very, very high for a child of retinoblastoma treating for three days, four days does not make any sense. So ideally I would stop at 60 centigrade per hour and then beyond that we don't use the source. So these are the type of plaques. What we see the tumor is posterior, uh, closer to the uh, um, optic nerve. Then we use uh, notch and the tumors which are anterior at OSSN, we use uh, without notch, which these are called uh, uh, round uh, 
plaque therapy. So based on the tumor site, we use this uh, uh, type of uh, notch, uh, notch plaque or round plaque. Now the results uh, of this regression rates so in hemangioma, as I just said, almost every patient responds to hemangioma. We can again do a second sitting if there is a partial response. OSSN, 82% uh, of these patients have an extremely good responses and retinoblastoma, two thirds of them. Because these patients, why I'm saying two thirds, unfortunately, these are recurrent tumors. These have been treated with local therapy chemotherapy and recurrent tumors are relatively uh, radio resistant and uh, we get only two thirds of them uh, complete responses. Whereas melanomas are uh, new cases and the results have been quite gratifying. 92% of them uh, would respond in these patients. So these are the eye salvages in a metastasis. 100% of them can be salvaged. OSSN, 82% of them, unless the tumor infiltrates into the orbit, Retinoblastoma, two-thirds of them, evil melanoma, 92%. Vision salvage, you have good yellow means that the improve, improvement in the vision. So you have hemangiomas, huge hemangiomas, 90% of them, the vision also improves. Retinoblastoma, vision improves by 96%. Whereas melanoma in 10,000 centigrade, even after delivering 10,000 centigrade, 60% of them uh, would have uh, improved vision. So, so that's the kind of... Uh, vision salvage that you get with this plaque brachytherapy. Life salvage, no issues on life salvage, except two of these patients had liver metastasis and died, and uh, two of them required uh, uh, enucleation, but two patients had um, liver meds and they it died. Complications are quite few because of the high dose of radiation with melanomas. Uh, you have uh, cataract, this is an uveal uh, um, uh, choroid, uh, choroidal uveal melanoma, so it was twice close to the uh, lens, so they have uh, cataract. Vitreous hemorrhages can happen if the dose is quite high, and retinopathy happened in only three uh, patients, that is 4%. So rest of the areas, the uh, complication rates are very, very few. So obviously, it is uh, dose dependent, and the uh, tumor height is the most important thing uh, to have your problems, because Tumor diameter is not a major issue. Uh, if the tumor diameter is more than 14 millimeters, preferably not to use it. Uh, but if the height is more than seven millimeters, then it's tough to deliver the doses. And if you still try to deliver, then you land up in complications like radiation retinopathy. So saving life is almost 98%. Uh, yeah, I salvage, we could achieve in 80% of the, that means the globe is salvaged in 80% of the patients. Vision salvage, uh, we could make it around 60% of them had vision salvage too. So plaque brachytherapy is an effective treatment option. Uh, it's a good eye salvage, can be feasible, and good vision salvage, and the complications rates are very, very less. So it obviously is a teamwork. Uh, the oncologist cannot do anything unless you have an, uh, a good ocular oncologist who would, uh, uh, they should have a red eye camera uh, to have uh, this kind of a uh, transpupillary thermotherapy. Uh, so it has to be a tertiary care of, uh, ophthalmic center where they have all the gadgets uh, to do it. Unless uh, you do that, you can't participate in the trials. Uh, we are into so many uh, trials. Uh, we're participating into retinoblastoma uh, group, international groups. So unless you have that uh, team uh, with an uh, ocular oncologist and a good tertiary care center, uh, the results will not be that good, which I have shown uh, in our uh, uh, data. So so this is briefly on that. Uh, if you have five minutes time, uh, Mandal, I'll just show you uh, plaque, uh, sorry, the interstitial brachytherapy a few slides. Absolutely, sorry. That will be really nice. Right. So the interstitial brachytherapy in orbit also is feasible. And I would like to show you a few slides, uh, especially lacking gland carcinoma is an area where uh, most of the tumors in the orbit, you can uh, get away by doing 5,000 to 5,500 centigrade. Only in an ocular uh, uh, orbital tumor where you have a lacking gland carcinoma, you need to deliver 6,000 to 6,600 centigrade. Uh, although we are able to deliver uh, that kind of a dose with external beam radiation, I would be happy to share that uh, at our center, we deliver 6,600 centigrade 
to the tumor bed in the lacrimal gland area. So in spite of that, what happens with us is these kind of patients who come to us are already being treated elsewhere. Surgery done, post-operative radiation done, which is usually around 45 to 50 gray, which is not going to serve the purpose at all. So these kind of patients come to us and this is one of the patients who's been treated and given post-op uh, a radiation of uh, 6,600 centigrade. You could see some kind of a deformity here, but this guy has completed his medicine now and he is doing post radiation. Now, so this is something called residual tumor after chemo radiation. What do you do? So you just leave it or do something more. This is what we do. If the patient comes to you 5,000 centigrade or 4,500 centigrade delivered elsewhere and you have a gross residual disease. The, these tumors, we do re-excision and do a implant in the tumor bed. This is the re-excision and in the tumor bed implant. So some, earlier we used to drill uh, in the superior orbital uh, a bone and then put the radioactive, sorry, the plastic tubes. Now we don't uh, drill anymore. We do under surface of the bone uh, uh, and place these uh, uh, plastic tubes and we are just pulled out after the procedure, after delivering the required dose. This is the uh, procedure and this is an after loading uh, uh, machine that you all know. So this is uh, recurrent after surgery. This is another patient, an young man, 26 year old man, tactical gland carcinoma. You see the drills, holes uh, being uh, done in the ridge and this is how the patients are comfortable. And this is the treatment delivered. This is another young girl. And there's another girl now, she, uh, believe me, she joined modeling now. She is doing extremely well. This is another patient, re-operated, re-radiated, and disease free after 2.5 years. These are the few slides, and uh, as I said, this girl uh, joined modeling now. She's from Kolkata. So thank you very much, and uh, we uh, anybody who's interested in uh, black brachytherapy or external beam radiation to the ophthalmic tumors, uh, you feel free to contact me on my email uh, and spend a couple of weeks at our center to get the feel of it. Now with the BRC black brachytherapy available in the country uh, with throwaway prices of 50,000 rupees, uh, the one center recently uh, we started in Delhi, they were very, very keen and they, the entire team had come here. They spent two weeks with us and uh, uh, of course with Zoom now we are able to they did a first case and we uh, helped them in how to get the procedure done and whatever the uh, small issues, teething issues, that's only during the initial phase. After that, you will be an expert. So uh, feel free to contact me. We would be more than happy to help you. Thank you so much, sir, for uh, a wonderful talk. And uh, I, I can say that I actually heard in one of your presentation this topic and it was mesmerizing. So uh, I thought that uh, it should be a nice thing if everyone can get the opportunity to listen from you. And uh, uh, so there are a couple of questions. If you have time, then we can take a couple of the questions. Sure, sure. The first question is from Dr. Spandana. She has asked, what will be the gap between two sessions of melanoma treatment in case you are doing in a fractionated manner? So, uh, the treatment time to respond uh, uh, in a melanoma is uh, six months. Nevertheless, we normally ask the patient to come after, if, if first follow-up would be after six weeks, and then every uh, six weeks we'll be continuing following for the next six months. So whenever we feel that the tumor is still active and it's only partially responded, we can avoid, uh, do it after 12 weeks. That means three months gap period you can do it. But normally we look at uh, six months and uh, whatever repetitions that we have done was around six months. But you can do it after three months. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Shilpa Reddy has asked about what are the clinical scenarios of retinoblastoma where plaque brachy is considered? As I said, uh, radiation has taken a backseat in the management of retinoblastoma. So the uh, after you do chemotherapy and after you do local therapy, in spite of doing local therapy, if you have a recurrence, and then we do high-dose chemotherapy, and even after that, the patient does not respond, and the tumor is less than 14 millimeters, 
then we would do plaque fracture. And if there are no uh, vitreous seeds, that's very, very important. So then only we do plaque fracture. And the next question from her is SBRT versus plaque brachy for uveal melanoma. Yeah, so SBRT, whatever SBRT that you have, even in proton, uh, only proton can deliver a little higher than the photon uh, SBRT. So SBRT cannot deliver more than 6,000 centigrade with photon, whatever, get, whatever uh, technology that we have. And uh, with proton, you can go up to uh, 7,000 centigrade. But plaque breath plaque therapy can deliver 10,000. So there is no comparison. And you all agree the best conformity that you can get is uh, with plaque bracket therapy. Because with the, with the plaque bracket therapy, few millimeters away, it is just 500 centigrade. So you can't get the, that kind of a conformity index uh, with any kind of a external beam radiation. Absolutely. Yes. I, I, I remember in one of the presentations, even Dr. D.N. Sharma had this topic for a debate. Mm -hmm. And he showed really in a very nice manner that how brachy therapy can actually beat proton in this dose follow-up thing. Uh, Dr. Shakti has a question for you, sir. Uh, for every fraction, shall we put incision over conjunctiva? Every fraction, you mean? Every plaque placement? Yes. I think, sir, uh, he, uh, he perhaps is willing to know if there is a uh, second treatment or third treatment, perhaps. Yeah, so conjunctiva healing is very, very fast. It just, it's like, it just heals up without even, without a scar. So you can do conjunctival incision any number of times. Right, sir. So Dr. Sandeep Jain has a question for uh, which cases are better suited for proton and can it be used in uveal melanoma plaque brachytherapy? No, conjunctival melanoma, sorry, sorry, choroidal melanomas with proton brain therapy are only tumors which have got uh, the height of the tumor is most important than the diameter. So the height of the tumor, as I mentioned to you, it's more than 7 millimeters and less than 10, 10 millimeters. Those are the areas where you can think of doing proton brick therapy because the plaque cannot give more than 14 millimeters base diameter and more than 7 millimeters height. So those kind of tumors should can be taken up by proton beam therapy. But with a word of caution, tumors which are more than 9 to 10 millimeters height, then it's best to do enucleation. The results of radiation therapy are quite poor. So, and also that the chances of metastatic disease of the tumors which are more than 10 millimeters height, then it, it's very, very poor. So ideally, earlier the better you do enucleation without trying external beam radiation. Right, sir. Uh, there is another question. I don't know uh, the name. How are the plaques disposed after the possible number of Times. So we have a system in place. Uh, you have uh, uh, Bibik uh, had a um, uh, you know uh, agent in uh, India which take bracket therapy sources back to their company. So that is one. Uh, BRC has got their own system uh, in place. Uh, the radiation physicist uh, will coordinate with them and tell them. And we have a container which is absolutely safe. Uh, they would come to your hospital and uh, uh, we have a. Uh, disposal uh, section and they would take it back. They're only not a worry at all. In fact, we keep these sources for a long time, more than two years, three years, four years. But you should have a number and you should inform the BRC that this can, this source from BB or whatever that you are buying from is still with you and you are disposing in whatever date that you are disposing on. It's very strict. So you, you cannot escape. You cannot keep it in your pocket and go home. Sir, uh, Dr. Sanjay has a question. Mold plasiotherapy versus plaque brachytherapy, is there any difference? Yeah, so mold, it's all, it's absolutely the same. It's all the site which can, like you have a palate, then you can have a mold. You have a skin, then you can have a skin mold. But plaque is something on the, on the choroid, you can't, put a, you can't put a mold. So as simple as that. So otherwise, plaque brachytherapy or mold, is up. See, I did a, a brain implant with a mold with a dental compound sitting on the uh, in the parietal region with the holes drilled on it. So it is only a convenience. So it's only that you idea is to put the brachytherapy sources close to the target. So whichever is feasible, it is possible. Then you can do it. Mold or a plaque or one and the same based on the site. You have to decide where to put what used.
Hello. Yeah, I'm here. Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Sandeep Jain has another question. Does Bibig supply set of all three yeah. plugs so, or we can select one? No, no. It, you, I am in your pocket is heavy, then you can buy all the three. Now it's unfortunately it's very, very expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, of rupees for each source after concession, it's the on, uh, on paper price is 11 lakhs. When we started plug bracket therapy, it was 5 lakhs per source. So the you know the rupee value is coming down, the it's European value is going up. So it's now present value is 11 lakhs. So there is no need to go for it. We have now developed a plaque for brachytherapy, uh, uh, ruthenium plaque for BRC, which is just 50,000. But we just uh, started round plaque to start with. Second one was uh, notch plaque. Now we are trying to develop a optic a notch with for uh, optic nerve. Right, sir. Dr. Shilpa has asked another question. In case of ocular meds, either scleral or UPL, can we consider plug breaking? Yeah, of course. That's the best way to do it. Dr. Rahul has a question. I think it's an interesting question. If a lesion has a height of more than 7 mm, can we use a combination of EBRT initially to reduce the height followed by plug brachytherapy? No, not at all required. Not at all required. So again, plug brachy, uh, external beam radiation uh, delivering external beam radiation by, let us say, you delivered 5000 centigrade. So that means you already, call the, uh, the conjunctiva, so the retina has already got 5000 centigrade. And adding further with the plaque brachytherapy is not going to serve the purpose. So ideally, 7 millimeters height, uh, uh, plaque brachytherapy is the best way to go. So we, personally, I have never used a combination of external beam radiation plaque brachytherapy. And I don't see any advantage using both the combinations. Dr. Siddharth has a question. Do you have any video to show us? I think that's a, that will be very interesting if you have any video to share with us. Yes, I, you can uh, send me an email. I'll send you the video. Video of the whole procedure. That will be really nice, sir. Sure. And the last question, sir, I think uh, Dr. Shravanti has asked SBRT for UPL melanoma, the dose and fractionation and total dose. What do you uh, use? See, again, it all depends on the size and uh, but not normally what, what we have treated uh, uh, SRS is for the choroidal meds. So we haven't done any SBRT for the choroidal melomas because the results have been very, very poor. We give them a straight answer to the patient if the tumor is more than 8 millimeters, it's better to go for enucleation or phased manner uh, two uh, doses of plaque bracket therapy. External beam radiation, we haven't done any patients, which I think probably it's more than a decade that we have done uh, external beam radiation for uh, choroidal melanomas. But having said that, yes, you can try SBRT, equivalent dose. We have all the calculations uh, based on the uh, dose per fraction. Uh, we can deliver SBRT or SRS, even in five fractions also you can do. For uh, choroidal meds though, we do a single fraction or uh, uh, three fractions, so which we have very uh, gratifying results. So I can share that uh, data with you, uh, the doses what we use for choroidal meds, but we haven't done uh, for uh, choroidal uh, melanoma, but for the calculation purpose, we can uh, design based on the size of the lesion. Uh, uh, we do large dose per fraction or small dose fraction with multiple fractions. Thank you so much, sir. And uh, I think there is no more question. It was really a mesmerizing session once again. And as I always appreciate you, your punctuality, we started at, at eight and it's just about to be nine and we are, uh, and we, are, we have completed in proper time. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, it was a pleasure having you and it was an excellent session. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Good night, sir. And uh, we are going to end this session today. Thank you all. And we'll, uh, we'll have class tomorrow again at 4.30. Uh, just a message for all of you. Uh, JP Agarwal sir has uh, told that class will start at 4.30. And he has requested that please students get your questions ready so that he can answer your questions, whatever you ask. Thank you so much. And once again, thank you to Dr. Reddy sir. Have a good night.